Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Achano, and welcome to a code review of my Ludum Dare game uh, called Growth, or Grow, actually. It's kind of got two names because the title of the window seems to be Grow, but the name of the game seems to be Growth. Anyway, the point is today we're going to be reviewing the game that I made for Ludum Dare uh, 34. Um, so if we go over here to my GitHub and we go over all the way on to Growth, here it is. And there'll be a link to this in the, in, in the description. This is the entire uh, source code to that game. Now, um, the thing is, uh, if you look at the commits, there are a few things that I changed. So basically, um, when I submitted it, uh, as you'll see, I, I accidentally left the camera speed at 10 instead of 3. Um, so basically what happens in the game is you kind of speed up after a while, except I was kind of debugging that speed up and making sure that the, the text aligned properly and it happened at the right time. So I really wanted to see that I really wanted to be ob like, I really wanted the speed up to be obvious when I was debugging it. And I accidentally left that code in when I, um, when I did some stuff to it. Now I also left some other debug code in the actual game. <laughs> um, when I submitted it initially, and I think that the code is actually still in here. But um, don't worry, I updated, I updated the London Death submission to not include debug code. Anyway, uh, that is not the correct way to ship a game, but it's London Dare, so you know, fun stuff. Now let's download let's download the zip file, and I'll see you guys in Eclipse. All right, so as we open up Eclipse here, this is actually a new workspace. I'm going to pop over into the workbench, and a lot of people ask me this all the time, so I'm just going to show you guys how to do it one more time. The best way to import a project into Eclipse is actually pretty simple. All you have to do is uh, head on over to the actual workspace location. So you can see that here we, here we have the growth workspace that I've just created. It's completely empty. Um, this is the zip file that I downloaded from GitHub. Just You can see all the code is here. Just copy that, paste it in into your workspace. We can rename it something like just growth, make it a bit easier. And then in Eclipse, just create a new Java project, type in the exact name of that project folder, hit finish, and that's it. That's all you have to do. None of this right-click import going through this stuff. Just no. Just create a new project, but match the name. And as you can see, everything here is imported properly. So if we find the main class, which I believe is just called game, um, and I'll just adjust my stuff. All right. So as we open up this main uh, method, uh, let's just try and hit run. All right. And as you can see, it works perfectly uh, right out of the right out of the gate, which is the the correct way to handle this. I was actually a bit worried about, um, one thing that might be wrong for you is if you go into Java, into the properties and then build path, uh, this JFX RT thing, uh, depending on which version of the JDK you have, it probably won't actually uh, like link correctly because you might not have it at this path basically. So you might need to go into your, uh, your libraries under the uh, build path in the properties and actually edit the path for that and change it to whatever your wherever it actually is. I didn't actually, I could have obviously put this into the actual folder, but it is, I think it's pretty big. It's like 17 meg and I didn't really want to do that. So um, it wouldn't have been a bad idea obviously, but I just didn't do it. So you'll have to find it yourself. This is the Java effects uh, thing. It's usually in your JDK and then just JRE lib and uh, EXT. And then as you can see, it's right here. Okay, cool. So you'll, you'll need that. That's only used for audio. So let's do a code review. Now I haven't actually looked at this or planned anything regarding this code review whatsoever. So this is just going to be kind of an on the fly type thing. Um, and I'm just going to go through this code and talk about it a little bit and, uh, and whatnot. If you guys have any questions about anything I say, or you feel I didn't cover anything, just leave a comment below and I'll try and reply to as many comments as I can so that this is more of a complete kind of interactive code review that involves you guys as well. All right. So let's just start with this. Um, let me preface this entire thing by saying this code is horrendous. I do not recommend anyone really look through this code without the, like, and with the intention of really learning from it. There are some things here that I think would probably not be too bad, but most of it is very, very bad, especially from like the performance kind of optimization point of view. Okay. Because I made this game in about 10 hours. It was a very lazy Sunday and I just really just did not care about setting stuff up properly. I just wanted to get it done. Okay. So, uh, that's the idea. <laughs> okay. So I didn't read really, this. Isn't like, this isn't, I, I, I could have obviously just cleaned up the code a little bit and optimized it and probably made it really perform 10 times faster. Uh, within a few hours uh, the next day, but I just didn't really feel like it. Okay, so this code isn't 
um, isn't fantastically optimized. I know there are a lot of very, very silly things that I do here, but I just didn't care. I just, I just wanted it to work and it was kind of quote unquote good enough. So here we have it. Okay. So let's talk about this. This is the main, uh, this is the main class called game. As you can see, it extends canvas and runnable. So we get, uh, we essentially start the game by making a new thread and then, uh, that calls run. And then we kind of initialize the game via init and then we get into the main game loop and that's pretty much it. That's how the game starts. So if you go into init, you can see that uh, apart from setting up the window, we also uh, set the, uh, the, the, the music to actually start playing and it will kind of keep looping throughout the entire uh, lifespan of the actual application, okay? Um, that's all there is in initialization. Load sounds isn't even in there. Load sounds is actually in the game's constructor as long with, along with a lot of different things. So, you know, should it be there? Maybe, maybe not. Doesn't really matter. Um, seems to work pretty fine. We're not using anything like OpenGL, so we can kind of set this up in a multi-threaded kind of thing, right? So you can see that, for example, um, uh, like level loading and loading sounds and whatnot happens on like one thread and then we start a new thread for the actual game. So whilst they don't run concurrently, um, that's something that OpenGL might have complained uh, with because if obviously if we make any kind of OpenGL calls or anything like that in this thread and then we like create the context in this thread essentially and then try to use it in the other thread, we would get problems. So that's just something to watch out for um, if, you, uh, if you want to, I don't know, have a go of of porting this into OpenGL or anything like that, or just in general. Um, so that's the idea, okay? Uh, pretty simple. Uh, the level class is pretty much where everything is. We'll kind of go through these classes one by one and we'll see what we what we have here, but I wanna talk a bit more about the game loop. So we've got this update um, uh, function, and the only, the only thing that it does, as you can see, is it just updates the level. Pretty simple, right? It kind of just moves everything into the updating for level, which is where everything kind of happens. Um, Render. Render is pretty simple as well. Uh, there's nothing really complicated here. It's very similar to like the game programming series and all that kind of pixel rendering stuff. Um, we essentially have a uh, an image that we uh, whose pixels we modify pretty much every frame. Um, and we then just draw that image at the end and that's pretty much all we get. Now, because uh, font rendering, um, because obviously I didn't want to <laughs> kind of create my own font rendering system for that kind of per pixel renderer, I just wanted to use Java's uh, draw string uh, function, but I also wanted to be able to access that from anywhere. So what I ended up doing is creating a static string buffer, which is just basically just a list of these, this thing called string thing, which if you go to it, it's just, it's just a basic struct uh, with a bunch of data, such as the string that I want to draw, where I want to draw it on the screen, the font I want to use, uh, whether or not it's fixed. So fixed just means whether or not the uh, the screen glass and well, the actual renderer should offset that font at all. So basically, if fixed was set to true, it means that it kind of should be offset by the camera, right? So wherever the camera is in the world, uh, we should offset the position of the string based on where that camera is. So basically, it's fixed onto the actual in, in, in into the actual game world, right? Whereas if it was if this is set to false, it's like floating. So basically, if I set it equal to position 10, 10, then it will be um, in the top left corner of the game at all times, no matter where the camera is. Whereas if it was fixed, it would be a 10, 10 in world space rather than screen, rather than screen space, essentially. Um, okay, color, yeah, the default color is white and whatnot. But anyway, you can see that we set all these parameters up and then we can go ahead and actually, um, you can see that offset happening here uh, if it's fixed. Um, we draw the string, right? Pretty simple. And you can see that we draw the string at the very end of the frame. So once we draw the image, which is the actual, pretty much everything, uh, if I bring this up, we could probably actually take a look at this as well. Uh, let's just close these things out. So you can see that if I don't draw the image, which is an issue because it, get, it actually clears stuff for us. Um, yeah, this is fun. Uh, <laughs> I could quickly fix this. Let's quickly fix it. So if we set the color to black and then we fill a rectangle like that, then we'll get rid of that. And you can see that we'll be see at the essential strings. So these are all the strings in the game without anything else, right? And if I lose the game, if I even can lose the game, yep then uh, yeah, you can see that's kind of how the string rendering worked compared to everything else. Um, 
which uh, would have just looked like this essentially without strings, right? So it's all pretty simple, nothing too difficult here. A few people were asking me during the live stream what that whole string buffer situation was and now you know. Okay, cool, so let's move on. Uh, the biggest class in the game is probably level, either that or screen. Let's take a look at screen first actually because screen is all of the rendering code. Um, the reason I wanted to uh, use pure Java and whatnot is because my original plan was actually to use kind of a per pixel renderer and there's no way you can do that in OpenGL. Um, of course, you could draw a quads that are one by one pixel, and that wouldn't be the worst thing to do in the world, especially if you batch them together. But there's no reason to do that. And you do kind of use most of the, your hardware acceleration if you do that anyway. Um, and I really wasn't interested in that at all. Um, so there was no real reason for me to use it. Um, of course, in the end, I did actually end up using rectangles instead of actual per pixel stuff. So yes, this game would have performed probably 10, 10 to 20, probably like 50 or 100 times faster. Um, maybe not 100 times faster, but like 50 times faster probably if I actually used OpenGL and I actually um, wrote a proper engine for it. But anyway, that's not that's not the spirit of what I'm there anyway. <laughs> so, screen class. Um, we have the pixel reference. So this is a reference to the uh, pixels that are eventually get drawn onto the screen. We have uh, the width and height of the screen, of course. We have the offsets. So these are the camera offsets, essentially. Um, and then uh, we have an array list of lights, even though there's actually only one light. Okay, so um, uh, this stuff is pretty boring. Clear, you can see it just goes through every single pixel, so it's to whatever color we want, effectively clear clearing the screen. The fill rect uh, method is, again, extremely simple. It always uses an offset, so it always um, depends on where the camera is. Um, and then it essentially just fills a uh, like a rectangle uh, with certain colored pixels. Draw texture does exactly the same as fill rectangle, except it samples from a texture. Uh, and you can see that it also um, uh, basically will uh, not render anything with an alpha, essentially. So the reason this is the reason this is zero and whatnot, um, well, the reason alpha says less than zero is because, of course, uh, integers in Java are, are all signed, which means that this is actually resulting in essentially a negative number, uh, which is why we say that if, if, if this is negative at all, then we will um, not render it. Um, or rather, if it, is re if it is negative, then we will render it, okay? Because that alpha essentially will make sure that we are not sitting in zero alpha. Um, okay, so draw curve and whatnot. This is all pretty simple. Good thing I commented that. <laughs> Good thing I commented that out before I shipped it. But um, draw curve is not the simplest thing actually. Uh, but basically, what it does is you can see that it will uh, the whole the whole the whole thing that happens here is this calculate Bezier point, okay, or Bezier as some people might say it. Um, no one says that. Um, anyway, so we have all these uh, floats and essentially we calculate um, the first, second, third, and fourth term of a uh, Bezier curve. You might want to Google this for more information because I'm not going to explain it right here. But this is essentially just a very simple uh, Bezier uh, algorithm. Okay, so we have the four points that we define. Um, and then, of course, they kind of define the weighting of the line. And then we uh, will essentially come up, come out with a point. Okay. So um, once we get that point back, you can see we get the pixel right over here. Uh, we'll essentially render it, okay? Now, um, you can see that the thickness ends up being used to render an actual rectangle. I used to just render single pixels, which is why I wanted the software rendering and whatnot. But now it, uh, now it essentially just renders rectangles of quite a high thickness. And the thickness, as you can see, also depends on what, like what Y position we're sitting at. So the closer to the bottom of the screen we are, the thicker it will be. The closer to the top of the screen we are, like when we actually draw this curve, which is this thing, you can see it's thinner up the top and thicker down the bottom. All right. So... What's next? Um, yes, so you can see that we check for all walls. Walls are actually those rocks, right? I called them walls for some reason initially. Um, you can see that if there actually is a collision uh, with basically like one of the top three kind of segments. So a segment is essentially a rectangle. So because this curve is made out of a bunch of rectangles, if we collide with like the top three, any of the top three really kind of translates into being the head of the of the plant, um, then uh, you can see that we do game over. Otherwise, if we collide with any of the segments that are not the top three, uh, then we actually destroy the wall, okay? So this is all about collision happening inside the renderer, ladies and gentlemen, inside the renderer. That is how good this code is. Um, 
And then finally, of course, if we actually do hit, if the if the top of the snake, or I keep saying snake because it kind of looks like a snake, but if the top of the plant hits any of the side walls, you can see basically by just comparing the X position of it, then we will also lose the game. Uh, light pass. This is some beautifully inefficient code here. Um, okay, so what we do, first of all, is uh, we get the position of the light. You can see there's only one light. We only support one light because I'm always getting the first light in the array list. We also set the lights Y to minus 400, even though it was 450. So, I mean, I could have just set it up here, but you know, I didn't because laziness and whatnot. As I said, this is not the best code. Um, so, uh, we figure out the attenuation. This is a terrible algorithm. What we should have done is actually figured out a proper, um, a proper model for this lighting, but again, I didn't do it. It wouldn't wouldn't have been that that difficult anyway. But um, this should basically have been one, and then we could have offset it essentially by uh, one by one or something again, um, and then actually had it uh, being it in a in a range. But instead, I just kind of kept increasing this number until we got to the brightness that I wanted, and it's just it's a bit of a mess. But hey, get distance uses a square root, which is why this whole thing is very slow. Uh, if I didn't use a square root, every single pixel of every single frame, then this game would run significantly faster, probably three times faster. So square roots are very expensive, don't use them. Um, didn't really need to use them here. I could have used something something like Manhattan Distance, which I imagine would have been close enough for what we're doing. But you also have to remember that this is going through each pixel one by one. This isn't running on the GPU or, or anything, so it's not. it can't do parallel processing at all. Um, it's doing these one by one sequentially. And writing, uh, both reading and writing to that memory, which also isn't the fastest operation, but this whole thing is kind of slow. Okay, um, not to mention that we have to use ints here because we can't use bytes because because Java doesn't support that, um, or Java doesn't support unsigned types. But anyway, this is all a bit of a like interesting way of doing things. Um, this is again light. If I turn off the light pass. Uh, over here, then uh, we'll get like some flat lighting, but you can see the game will perform much faster. So what are we at? Like 700 FPS, okay? So it's seven times faster without the lighting. All right, it doesn't look as good, but hey, uh, it works seven times faster compared to this. So this is the lighting as you can see. Um, okay, so yeah, again, all it does for those of you who are not aware uh, is it goes through every single pixel, calculates the distance between the given pixel that is sampling, and the actual light source. And then based on the distance, it figures out a brightness for that pixel. And it will essentially then, as you can see, uh, multiply uh, the pixel's color by the brightness and then uh, write it back out into that pixel. So it just modifies every single pixel on the screen uh, based on how far away it is from the light source. Okay, and you can see the light source is actually off the screen. It's negative 400. If I set that to like something like, uh, I don't know, like 200 or something, then you'll see it on the screen. Uh, and you can see that the light source is right here, okay? Again, very bright, very incorrectly modeled, but uh, you get what you get, okay? <laughs> so, um, the, yeah, we've done that. Set camera, as you can see, the camera class is literally, I was going to do, I think I actually just forgot to mention that this game has absolutely no, um, like, camera clipping. Uh, I was going to say frostum culling, but this isn't really a frostum, because orthographic camera, but basically the idea is that there is no kind of visibility checking for any anything that gets rendered. Um, I'm pretty sure. I might have, I don't think I added that at all. So it has to go through pretty much every single uh, pixel of all of the uh, squares that we're trying to render, such as all of these, and then be like somewhere in the uh, fill rectangle, it'll be like, oh, hang on, we're not even remotely close to the screen. I'm going to continue, but it's already too late. It's already gone through this. So, um, Definitely could have done some kind of camera clipping situation, uh, making sure that what we're trying to render is actually inside the camera's uh, view space. Uh, but, you know, we didn't do that. That's also fun. Um, what else is cool in this game? So this is the screen class. Let's talk about level and how the game actually works. So we have the camera. Um, the camera is, as you know, just essentially a vector two, uh, vector two I. Uh, so we've got, we've got like, you know, two integers, um, and that's all that is. Okay. The points are the actual Bezier curve points. Now you can see that tragically I left code in here 
I left all of this debug code in here, which lets you select one of the points and then use the mouse to actually set the position of it. And the first version of the Ludum's Air game actually did have this code in it. I removed it since then. But basically what you could do is uh, you could actually select a point and then as you can see, it's really not gonna work with that, but let's see if I can, you can see that I can move the curve to wherever I want um, based on uh, which point I select and then moving the mouse button. So this was initially like a kind of, if I actually stop the camera though, you'll see it properly. Uh, this was this was essentially like early, early on kind of debugging code that I used to actually make sure that the curve looked nice and position it where I wanted it to be. Uh, but obviously I didn't need it in the future. So if we stop this, okay, so you can see that Fortunately, it'll still move, so let's not make it move. Uh, okay, let's comment that out. So, if I select like point, I think four is this one, you can see that I can actually, unfortunately it's still going up though. Maybe that's just a score. I hope we're not actually moving it up. Um, we might be, who knows. We do seem to be actually, which is a bit annoying because I'm pretty sure what if we just set the camera speed to like zero? Will that help anything? Okay, that seems to work. So unfortunately this is still kind of below, but you can kind of see how we can control the points using the camera, yeah? Or using the mouse rather. Very dangerous stuff. So of course I managed to ship that, but the idea is um, that you're not supposed to do that. But anyway, <laughs> so that's what all this code is, right? Um, that's all the kind of selection contact stuff. Now, uh, walls, basically this is just a uh, checking to make sure that if walls are destroyed that they get removed so that we no, wrong, we no longer render them. Um, walls are of course those kind of, uh, let's, you know what, let me quickly just open that up. So this rock thing is the actual wall, right? Uh, so we remove them. We also do the same thing to entities as well as update the entities. So the entities are really, what entities do we have? I don't actually know. What are entities? I think the walls are entities. Yes. So the walls and the wall fragments are entities. And we'll talk a bit more about the fragments and whatnot later. Um, okay. So we've got a left and right. So of course, if the player presses those keys, then we will essentially move the uh, the last point, so point number three, which is the fourth point, that is uh, essentially the head of the plant, right? And that's what you get to control by using the arrow keys, okay? So four points define the four kind of Bezier curves. If you, again, were to research Bezier curves and whatnot, you would probably understand that more if you don't already. Okay, so pretty simple. Every time the camera's Y uh, kind of um, passes a certain point. So the camera's Y, of course, is the camera's vertical position. So of course the game is continually kind of traveling in an upward direction. Uh, so the camera's constantly kind of moving up or, well, yes, kind of down. The, anyway, um, so the camera's constantly moving up and when we cross certain uh, thresholds, you can see it's all negative because the camera's actually moving down. But anyway, down is up, right? Because zero, zero is the top left corner. Uh, so if we want to move the camera that way, we're actually moving the camera, uh, like down. Okay. Because down is up in this case. Anyway, um, we display speed up messages and when we change the speed of the camera. Okay. The speed up message, uh, basically just adds this grow faster thing, which you'll see every time you, um, you pass a certain, uh, uh, Y position for the camera. Um, and of course it will actually speed up. So. This is how the camera speed works. So since the camera speed is traveling, the reason this is in a for loop, by the way, the camera speed is set to something like two, of course, then it'll get set to three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you survive that, then you're just really good, really. I haven't gotten any anywhere past camera speed, probably, th th oh, actually, I probably would have gotten up to like five or so, 40,000 isn't that much. But um, anyway, uh, the reason this is, this is inside a for loop instead of just doing something like uh, that, which of course you could have done, 
uh, is because we need to do this check. So uh, the way that this works, so these rectangles are the actual rectangles that we see on the side here, okay? Obviously, I didn't want to have an, like a, an infinite list of them, essentially, and we still have to render them every time. So what actually happens is that when we kind of reach the end, when one of these reaches the bottom, they kind of they kind of move up to the top so that they can be seen again, okay? And that happens all the time. So there's really only like 20 or 40 or so for both sides of uh, rectangles. They just keep, you can see their Y position keeps moving. Um, the issue is that the, the, like, the point at which is it decides to move the bottommost rectangle is when the camera's Y, uh, every 50 kind of pixels that the camera moves, it moves the rectangles. And you can see there's two of them because it moves one on the left side and one on the right side, okay? Um, and if we didn't have this, if we didn't have this for loop, which went one by one, we might end up missing this because if the camera's posi if the camera's speed happens to be three, you can see that it's not always going to be a multiple of 50. Okay, it might do something like 49 and then the next one might be 52, meaning we miss this, okay? Uh, so the easiest way to fix that is just to make sure it's in a for loop and then that means that we check, we kind of recheck camera's Y position every time it increments by one, okay? Um, and that's the safest way of doing that. All right, the score is based on the camera speed. So every single frame, we increase the score based on whatever speed the camera is at. So the score is roughly equivalent to the camera's Y position. Uh, these are the points that we set. Um, the swaying that you see, so you can see that how this kind of sways, that is all essentially sine waves, okay? Uh, based on the time. So the time is a variable that keeps getting increased every frame. Uh, and based on what the time is, we calculate a, uh, a position on the sine wave uh, for all the points except the head of the, of the plant, right? Which is what we control. So that's pretty simple how that works. Um, there's not really much to show here, okay? Just a bunch of sine waves. That's why it kind of sways left and right. Um, uh, what, what does this do? Okay, so obviously the head of the plant happens to just move left or right randomly um, throughout the game. You can see now it's moving right and I lost because of that. Uh, this is what figures that out, okay? So all we do is we, um, every time the time you know, it's kind of, it's essentially random, right? But every every time the actual time of the game uh, crosses a certain uh, random point in time, right? Uh, it will actually so it's it's basically essentially between 100 frames and uh, and 200 frames, right? Any time in between 100 and 200 frames, so every 100 to 200 frames, a random force will be generated, which causes this to move either left or right, and generate will essentially just generate a bunch of walls. Okay, and you can see the amount of walls that it generates is based on where the camera is. So the further up we get, the harder it gets because we generate more walls. Um, okay, and then of course we move the head of the plant uh, based on the force. Okay, so we also have states. There are two states. There's state zero and state one. State zero is the actual game being played. Uh, state one is the uh, game over message. So if the game over message is true and we press both of these buttons Then we end up restarting uh, the game Okay um, That's pretty simple. So game dot restart. What does that do? How do we restart a game? Uh, the way we restart a game is we just simply recreate the level. Okay, it's very very simple um, a lot of people always ask me how to uh, <laughs> It seems to be a very simple solution to a very complex sounding question where people always seem to have the problem of how do I restart my game again? And what a lot of people will unfortunately do is something like private void reset, right? And then that will go through like every variable, set it back to zero or set it back to its initial value. And then when you add more variables, you have to reset everything. It might clear all the lists. It might run help and like generate again or something. And it's just so messy. The best way to do it is simply just to recreate the instance of your level class. And that is it. Okay. That is pretty much the equivalent to restarting the actual application. Okay. So very simple solution. Um, to a uh, very simple problem. Okay, so um, this whole tutorial thing, by the way, is basically a list of strings or string things. 
uh, which are the tutorial that you actually see. So when this is scrolling up, you see all this text scrolling down, right? And all this does is, as you can see, places certain text at certain locations, okay? Create message will simply kind of create this string thing with a bunch of kind of defaults that we use for this help tutorial type of type deal. Uh, and then we, of course, uh, by adding it to the tutorial, what that will do is it will actually add it to, um, so speed up message also uses that, but the, t the way that the tutorial is used is, uh, over here, as you can see, every frame in render, we actually add it into the string buffer. Okay. Uh, again, do we need to add it into the string buffer when we have, uh, like past the tutorial area? No, but it still does it because, you know unoptimized. Um, okay, I'm actually surprised it runs this fast, to be honest. There is some serious, seriously bad code here. Okay, so let's talk about render, and first I'm going to sneeze. Alright, render. So, if the state, if we, if the state is the game, so if we're playing the game, then of course we set the camera, which just kind of sets up the X offset and Y offset variables on the screen. Uh, we fill all of the walls or all of the actual like rectangles we see on the sides. Uh, we render all of the walls um, and, uh, you know, we render all the entities and we draw the curve and we draw the strings and we rather add the strings into the string buffer. So we kind of defer the drawing of them. We don't draw them straight away because we can't. Um, and then we, uh, this is also the score string that we recreate every frame. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we add that, okay? And the score string, as you can see, is literally just the score, which gets incremented based on how fast the camera is going every uh, every update. Okay, so um, if the state is one, which means we're at the game over, we just set up a bunch of strings. Again, these could have been created at the beginning and then simply used instead of recreating themselves every frame, but, you know, laziness. Um, so yeah, this essentially just says everything that you see over here on this screen. I, I, I quite like the colors as well. This having like a little bit of like red in it and then kind of going more to green down the bottom. And you can see that is the case with these kind of colors. You can see that they progressively have more, uh, less and less red. All right. So, uh, destroy wall. This gets called from screen, I believe. So if we quickly just, what's the shortcut for this again? Is it that? Yeah. So you can see screen calls it over here. Um, and when we draw the curve, if we hit the wall, then we destroy the wall. Uh, and that kind of just says that if, first of all, the state is game over, then we don't do anything. Or if the wall is already destroyed, we don't do anything. Um, the reason is that since the reason we have to do this check is because this is actually inside a loop. Um, and you can see that that loop is uh, is this like going through every single wall? Um, and we might have hit it with, since we kind of do this, since one of the three segments at the very top can hit it, uh, we might end up calling this, uh, destroy wall thing three times. So I could have probably just broken away from this for loop if we did actually hit something like this, but I didn't. So, um, oh, sorry, rather, this is not the head hitting it. This is the body hitting it. So if any of the body pieces hit it, which usually is more than one piece, then it will actually, um, keep destroying the wall, but it's already destroyed and we can get issues with that, such as the sound playing more than once and the score increasing more than once and all that stuff. So that's why it's easier just to return straight away if it's already been destroyed. Um, and of course we, we end up adding a lot of broken walls if that also gets called multiple times. Okay, broken walls we'll talk about in a minute as well. And wall.destroy wall simply says destroyed true, meaning we can delete it later. Um, okay, game over, plays the sound, sets so state to one, that gets called whenever the head hits it, as you can see over here in screen, level dot game over. And also if we hit the sides, which, you know, also happens in screen, because why not? Um, okay, that's an overview of the level class. Uh, the rest is actually really simple. Uh, we've got stuff like texture loading, which is, again, very, very simple. We simply just uh, load a an image and extract all of the pixels and put them into this uh, buffer or this array. Um, a sprite sheet, again, just goes through and extracts uh, certain regions of a texture into their own texture, uh, like versions, texture class. Um, th the sound uses Java effects, right? Uh, the reason we use that is because that's probably, it's probably the easiest way to play like MP3 files and compressed sounds, not like wave files. Um, 
in uh, in Java, right? It's very simple as well. Um, light just contains stuff that like intensity that isn't even used anywhere. Um, input again, pretty simple stuff. Um, and so like we've got really bad stuff here, like this is key typed thing, which can only be called once per frame, um, or rather once before it's released. Um, and we've got, yeah, that's ridiculous stuff. Entity is the base class for like broken wall, essentially. So broken wall is probably one of the other big things in here. And I'll go through animated sprite quickly first. Animated sprite simply has a texture, uh, simply has an array of textures, which make up every single frame. Um, and then it's also got the current texture, which is the current frame. Uh, and well, all that happens is when you in it, when you instantiate it, you give it a bunch of textures, and then when, every time update is called, you basically increase the counter, uh, and then you of course loop the counter when it reaches the end of the animation, uh, and you set the current texture to whatever the, the whatever frame we're up to. Okay, and then you can of course get that current texture, and that is it. Very very simple. So we simply uh, we simply um, increment the index of the texture that we're up to based on what frame we're up, we're, up, we're up to in the animated sprite and uh, and that that is it really simple stuff um, okay broken wall the last thing I'm going to cover which is yeah the end of everything um, so this is quite interesting uh, we load a sprite sheet we create an animated sp uh, sprite based on we create an animated sprite array based on this sprite sheet let's take a look at the sprite sheet so broken wall of course is what happens when you actually let me see if I can reach it here um, so that you can actually see what, what, what I'm talking about. I'm considering just modifying the code to make it appear faster, but I'm not going to. Okay, so I had to skip until we found it, but we found like a wall thing. So you can see that when I hit it, it kind of explodes and a bunch of fragments kind of fly out, just like that. Okay, so that's what broken wall is. Broken wall is responsible for each of those pieces. Um, so what happens is the original wall, which is this thing, this rock, this disappears, and then what we get left with uh, is uh, this kind of huge sprite sheet, which contains um, each of the different pieces uh, of the actual uh, original kind of rock, which is which is this thing, right? This is the original rock, and then we split that up into a bunch of pieces. So these are all the different pieces, and then all that these kind of frames are, so the vertical kind of uh, coordinate decides which of these pieces because this is cut into a bunch of pieces. Uh, and then the if we go through the horizontal, right, this is just simply this piece rotated in two different rotations randomly, pretty much, okay? So you can see that it's just rotated. And that's just so that we don't have to do any kind of rotation in Java in like a per pixel type deal because that's not gonna be fast or look good. Um, so that's all it is. So it loads that sprite sheet. Uh, we've got a bunch of offsets that it sets up. These are purely hard-coded offsets so that we can put this back together, okay? So we basically, we look at each of these fragments which aren't randomly rotated. They're actually in the correct orientation to make this up. And then we put the puzzle, which is all this, back together. That's what these offsets are. Um, and then we uh, we can see that we've got this, um, this and little this little animation class, which is just essentially a list of positions. Uh, so this is like a it's basically a bunch of keyframes, right? So we create a bunch of keyframes. We keyframe the position of the of every fragment, um, and then of course there are twelve actual fragments. So we we um we create that and we create twelve animations, one for each fragment, uh, and then this is the actual animation being created. Um, all we do is we go through, so there are 24 frames. Um, the first frame is just the initial, uh, the initial position. And then what we do is we kind of, we modify the position by adding, uh, the offset, which happens to also be the direction in which it should travel in, along with a little bit of gravity. Uh, and then we just add that into the, um, into the animation. And that's it. So it's really simple. We just kind of, uh, create 24 frames of, uh, just different positions, which kind of go in an explodey kind of pattern. Um, and that's it. And then of course, in the update, it loops through every single animated sprite, updates it, which updates the animation, plays the frame, uh, and retrieves the correct position and whatnot, as you can see over here. So when we when we come to render the animated, the animated sprites, we look up the position based on what the current keyframe is and what the current frame is, so that we can look at the keyframe, which is what the frame thing is, which gets incremented, of course, every three, every three game frames, so 20 times per second. Um, and then we draw the texture. 
So that's it. Really simple. Um, nothing too fancy, but it gets the job done and it looks pretty cool. So anyway, that is it. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, if you have any more questions about things that I perhaps didn't cover, um, leave a comment below. Honestly, this wasn't a very complicated or difficult game or anything like that. There wasn't anything really too crazy going on. Um, again, I did, a, I did, I did it in like, you know, just one day pretty much. And I didn't really, um, I didn't really spend too much time on it. Couldn't really be bothered to be honest. Um, but I really liked what, what I came up with. I had a very busy weekend, which is why I couldn't devote as much time to Let Him Dare this time as I would, would have liked to. But, um, I was pretty happy with the game that, that I ended up coming up with. And, uh, yeah, it's quite nice. Might make a mobile version of this game. But, um, anyway, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.